And we've covered the issue of sewage in our rivers and seas extensively here on Breakfast. And this morning, the wildlife presenter Steve Backshaw is calling for the public to back his petition to get sewage levels in the Thames discussed in Parliament. Well, last week he told us how, after taking his own water samples, the pollution he found there was toxic. Consuming that would put you in hospital without any question. And it's not an exaggeration to say that it, it could have killed you. The levels of E. coli, norovirus, enterovirus were so high that sometimes the lab technicians wouldn't even open the, uh, the samples that were sent to them. There are people walking their dogs along the banks, there are kids splashing around in the water, my own kids, uh, and, you know, they could get seriously, seriously ill from this. Well, we can talk now to Steve, uh, who joins us from the banks of the River Thames, and also to James Wallace, who's from River Action. Good morning to both of you. James, we'll turn to you in just a moment, but Steve, can we just talk about how much that stretch of, of river means to you and your family? Because you live right next to it, don't you? I, I do, as, as Sally well knows, because she's been here herself. Uh -huh. um, yeah. You know, it's not just about me and my family. There are... Uh, thousands of people who have discovered the Thames, particularly since uh, the pandemic, as a place for, for, for leisure activity, as somewhere that people go stand up paddle boarding and rowing and sailing. They walk their dogs along the banks of the river. It's been, a, you know, a real source of comfort to so many people. And all of a sudden, I think we're discovering that, that you know, it can be potentially a very dangerous place because of these sewage outages. And Steve, as you, know, as you mentioned, you are literally in your garden, your house is right next to where you're standing. You have really young children who are right next to the river the whole time. How worried are you for your health, for their health? I'm pretty sad, actually, I have to say. You know, I have been teaching my kids to swim in this river, swimming here myself, and, you know, kind of banging the drum for, for local people to say, look, this resource is ours, it's spectacular, it's free, uh, you know, it's fabulous for you to come down and enjoy it. And it turns out that, you know, I may have been leading people in the direction of danger because after one of these sewage outages, the level of certain viruses and bacteria in this river are so high, and, you know, James will come on to that in a second because it is not just here, that being even close to the river could make them sick. And, and you know, I, I want to make sure that everyone has the information they need to know how to, to be here safely, but really that shouldn't be our job. You know, Thames Water are the ones who are putting the sewage into the river. It should be up to them to at least stop that happening, but, but also to let us know what the levels of the, these contaminants are. Well, you, you've tried to find out what the level is yourself, haven't you, by taking your own samples. Tell, tell us, what have you discovered? So I did my sampling through Bangor University's wastewater and wetlands units. So, you know, they are world experts in this sort of thing. And they were horrified. They described, they described it as being a, a, a death potion for the river. Levels of things like enterovirus, E. coli, uh, norovirus were so high that even tiny amounts could make you sick. You know, uh, levels of, of norovirus, for example, 10 gene counts per litre could make you sick. There were 39,000 gene counts per litre in the water here. That is half a, a kilometre downstream of the outage uh, pipe and about 24 hours after the last outage had happened. And those contaminants are going to remain in the substrate, in the mud at the bottom of the river for a very, very long time. And that's going to be the next stage of my testing is to find out how long it's staying in the mud. James, um, just talk us through what you have been finding and also what you're holding there in front of you. Sure. Well, good morning. Thanks for having me on. Uh, River Action, a, a UK charity, did a load of testing before the boat race that you guys reported on, and we discovered that there were up to 10 times the amount of E. coli present in the water before the boat race, and very tragically, three members of the Oxford team were seriously ill just before. No wonder they had a hard time on the water. Uh, I'm holding a World Health Organization-approved E. coli incubator, and as you can see on the results here, I did some testing yesterday in a different part of the catchment near the Kennet, which feeds into the Thames, and it shows 2,963 E. coli colonies per 100 millilitres. And what that means is if I was to give this to Steve to say cheers, he might die. That's how bad it is. It's full, and I will show you, it's full of sediment, and in there 
you can see Ugh. a death trap, as Steve described it. So what we have here is a situation on the Thames, both on the main body of the water, but also all across the catchment. Sewage getting into the water and putting our lives and wildlife at risk. And James, is that because it has been so wet recently and we've had overspills into, into rivers? Is that part of the problem? Well, unfortunately, it has been a very wet winter and that does have a very significant impact on the flow of water and the capacity that the sewage outflows that can handle. However, this is a systemic issue. And in fact, most people watching this now won't realise that water companies are not required to remove pathogens like E. coli from even treated final effluents. So all effluent coming out of water treatment plants, like those up the river from here, will contain bacteria. And in fact, I was just checking this morning, uh, Forley Court in Henley, which is just a few miles upstream, has been discharging for 733 hours this year already. Thames Water has discharged for 200,000 hours in 2023. So it's no wonder at all that we're seeing such a catastrophic situation here. And this is really because the Environment Agency has failed to monitor and regulate. They've asked the water companies to effectively mark their own homework. And by doing so, I'm afraid, not always tell the truth and also not be held to account. So they can get away with impunity. They will profit here and they will not invest in the people and the planet instead. Steve, you've been to some fairly scary places around the world. You know, you've been diving with sharks, climb mountains, all of that kind of thing. When did you start to feel that the actual place where you live, when did you start to feel that that might be dangerous? When did it change? Um, well, I think, like most people around here, I just thought it was pretty grim. You know, the local residents refer to it as being the, uh, the crappuccino. For several days after an outage, the water around the eddies will be brown and fluffy. And, you know, you kind of think, oh, that's, that's not very nice. You know, there's poo floating into our river. But when you actually start to, to break it down and, and run the numbers, you find that it, it's just way, way worse than that. It's all the very uh, worst of things that pass through the human system are going out into what we consider to be our river. Um, and I, I think, you know, we have passed the point where we all go, oh, God, this is such a shame. Uh, something really, really needs to be done. And that has to come from way up the chain, because uh, as James says, you know, Thames Water are not required to make these changes themselves by off what. So, you know, it has to come from the very top of the tree that these uh, changes have to be put in place. James, Water UK, representing the water companies, say we recognise the current level of spills is unacceptable. We have a plan to sort it out. And that they say between 2025 and 2030, water companies want to invest £11 billion, so three times the current rate, they say, to cut spills from overflows as quickly as possible. They say they need off what to give them the green light so they can do that. Does that sound like a realistic plan to you? And, and what could be the impact on, on bill payers? Well, it's a very, very good question, and I think it's in the nuance of it. I'm not sure if you're aware, but when they say water companies want to invest, what they really mean is they want us to pay. I am a Thames Water customer, so is Steve, and it's going to be through bill hikes that, unfortunately, we are going to have to clean up this mess, unless the government intervene, which is why, as I'm sure you are aware, Thames Water are on the cusp of collapse. There's a possible situation of special administration measures being put into place, which means effectively temporary nationalisation, which again the public will pay for through our tax. And this is a burden that we should not have to do. For over 30 years now, the water industry has been privatised. And this is the direct result of when you have a geographic monopoly, where in this case you have the country's biggest water company with 15 million customers and no effective regulation. When you have a geographic monopoly like that, the only way it can work is if you have really strict regulation through Ofwat and the EA. But the EA's budget has been cut by about 70% in the past 14 or 15 years, which means they don't have the teeth anymore. They don't have the staff. And as I mentioned earlier, the water companies are being allowed to monitor themselves. So ultimately, we have a regulatory failure here. So the good news here is that it's an election year and at some point we will have a new government. I don't care who they are, it can be the same government, but as long as they do better and they can hold these companies to account and they put us and nature before the needs of what tends to be foreign investors who are seeking a quick win. Just quickly, Steve, we're running out of time here, but um, what's the answer? 
Uh, th that's, that is a massive, massive question. You know, I spent a day with Thames Water last week uh, and they were you know, very honest with me. They, they knew what needed to be done. They knew the sort of uh, measures that had to be put in place to stop this from happening. Um, but it costs a lot of money. They're not required to do it, so they won't. So, you know, I think that, uh, like, like James says, uh, we are in an election year. Use your vote wisely. Gents, thank you so much for joining us this morning from Maidenhead on the banks of the River Thames. Thank you for your time.